So what we're going to talk about, and this is something that I didn't do last year, uh, West Africa's Golden Age, or uh, the subtitle Before the European Invasion. Um, so uh, let me no, no. go on. Now, before we get started, there, these are some very, very important things to remember. Uh, this is going to be dealing with the period that we call medieval in, in the European Eurocentric time pattern, which is about 400 ACE to 1500 ACE. Now, the same time in Europe was called, uh, depending on who you read, either the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. Um, and we're going to focus on West Africa simply because that's where the majority of Africans were kidnapped from before being transported to the New World and, and, and being enslaved. So <laughs> the purpose of this uh, discussion is to see just who they were. Um, one of the excuses that was given um, and justifications was that enslavement was a, a boon, was an advantage for these poor, uncivilized, uh, barbaric Africans, so that um, the they were being done a favor by being um, enslaved. In some cases, we're going to do a compare and contrast method for, the, for comparison to Europe at the same time. And basically, I'm going to deal with just a few empires in that method. Um, it is extremely important to remember that Arab or Islamic enslavement was going on from around 600 ACE, um, actually up until the current day. Um, there are some scholars that have uh, that have taught that if it hadn't been for the Arab or Islamic uh, slave trade, that the Europeans never would have been able to achieve uh, what they did achieve. Now, uh, obviously, that's uh, arguable, but uh, it's important that we uh, don't forget that Arab enslavement was going on. Probably one, uh, and, and actually, that is a whole lecture. Uh, one, of, one of my teachers, Dr. John Henry Clark, used to lecture on what he called the Indian Ocean uh, slave trade. Uh, the, the last thing is that what we're going to do today is just a very superficial, and it's an introduction. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about a lot of things, but I want to just introduce the ideas because I suspect that um, a lot of these have been romanticized. A lot of these, uh, this information has been romanticized. Now, the other thing is that majority of the information we know about this period was documented by Muslim scholars in Arabic. And because of the, uh, the intellectual arrogance of, of many European scholars of, of that day, um, they did not think that if it wasn't written in one of the uh, Romance languages or Latin based languages that it was worthwhile. But uh, these are some of the, the, the books and the scholars who actually uh, wrote a great deal on this period. Um, Going to first talk about ancient Ghana. Now, first of all, ancient Ghana is not the same as current day Ghana. Ancient Ghana was uh, an empire that lasted from 300 A.C.E. to 1100 A.C.E. Um, that's about 800 years. That's longer than America. Um, founded by a matrilineal ethnic group called the Soninkes, and they spoke the Mende language, which is still spoken uh, uh, in many places in uh, West Africa. It's located in an area that's now Southeast Mauritania and parts of Mali, Senegal, Gambia, and Guinea. 
It started out as a kingdom and like many empires do, they annexed other kingdoms and evolved into an empire. And one of the things that made Ghana so uh, powerful and so rich was the fact that it was located at the crossroads of two main trade routes for gold and salt. And it uh, became wealthy as a result of controlling those routes. And they levied taxes, import and export taxes um, for these uh, productions. The capital city, which had an estimate, estimated population of 20,000 at its most, had two sections about six miles apart that were connected by a long boulevard. Uh, in one section was uh, reserved for their trade partners. And the other section was reserved for the citizens of uh, ancient Ghana. And the king personified the spiritual being and welfare of the people through the ancestors. Much of what is currently practiced in terms of traditional African spirituality, even today. In the year 1065, the Tunka or king was, his name was Menin. Now in compare and contrast, he lived in a palace made of stone and wood that was adorned with sculpture, paintings and glass windows. At the same time, the castles in 1066 England were originally a, a large mound of dirt with a wooden tower on top and wooden windows with an iron bar. Yeah. They later had glass, but at this time there was no glass. Um, in 1065, Tukuminen maintained a standing army of 200,000 of which 40,000 were archers. I guess you call them the uh, artillery. Whereas the Norman army under William the Conqueror that invaded England in 1066 was only about 15,000 people. Uh, at its peak, uh, again, the Ghana Empire had a population of several million people and a territory of uh, 250,000 square miles. Um, it was... Uh, a kingdom in which uh, people were good to each other. According to Al Idrisi, one of the Arab scholars, the royal family in Ghana would feed thousands of people at a time in banquets, more lavish than anything Europe had seen at that time. Ancient Ghana was invaded by the Almoravids, who were Berbers from Morocco in the 11th century. And these folk, subsequently also lost control and the Ghana empire disintegrated into smaller states that were still independent, but, uh, but weaker. From those states arose Mali. Uh, Mali had its roots in Kangapa, a small state that was actually part of the Ghana empire and was established by the Mandinka people that are popularly called the Mandingo. It became much more highly organized administratively and politically than Ghana. The first Malian emperor was Sandiata Keita. Uh, his other name was Marijata. And he conquered Ghana and reigned until from 12, 15, 1230 until his death in 1255. He expanded the empire uh, uh, to include uh, more Mauritania, Southern Algeria in the North and Northern Nigeria in the South. Ancient Mali was the first great Muslim state in the Sudan. Um, for those who don't know, the Sudan is a geographical area uh, that comes across the top part of, uh, of Africa, just below the Sahara, so from West Africa to East Africa. And they call that the Sudan. Um, uh, Sandiata converted to Islam, but m multiple writers say that uh, he did that more as a gesture of friendship to the trading partners, but that he actually practiced traditional religion, which actually became problematic. A lot of the Arabic uh, writers uh, didn't write a lot about him because 
of his religion. Um, Sundiata gained control of the salt and gold that had monopolized by Ghana. He captured the copper mines of Takeda. He captured the trading towns of Walata, Jenny, and Gao. We're going to talk a little bit more about them later. And he moved the capital from Jeriba to Niani. He advanced a program of agricultural expansion and turned many of his soldiers into farmers in order that they would have an adequate food supply. Um, Mansa Muhammad Ibn Ku, who was uh, Mansa Musa's predecessor, most folk have heard of him. He was uh, sometimes called Abu Bakr, who was a great grandson of Sanjata, uh, was said to have equipped 200 ships with men and another 200 with gold, water, and other provisions, and told them to go explore and, and until you reach land or until your food gave out and then come back. Only one ship came back with news and the Sultan then outfitted, uh, according to record, 2,000 ships, 1,000 for him and his men and 1,000 for provisions. He never returned. Um, Ivan Van Sertima, uh, who is, is, is listed in my references, wrote a, a, ground, uh, a groundbreaking book called um, they came before Columbus, uh, but then he followed it up with uh, African presence in ancient America, in which he gives uh, evidence that there are, and I, would, and I apologize, I wasn't able to find this, uh, but he gave evidence that there are, there's Mende script in parts of Tennessee and uh, some of the places where you had the mounds of the mound builders. And uh, he also gave considerable evidence of Mandinka influence in Mexico and Central America, as, as well as up uh, as far north as Canada. Mansa Musa, who was Abu Bakr's half brother, succeeded him in 1307. Most folk have heard of Mansa Musa because of uh, he was known as being the, the richest man the world has ever known. Um, he reigned 24 years, made Mali famous in the world. In fact, one scholar actually believes that uh, Mansa Musa was the reason why uh, Europeans became interested in Africa. Uh, and I'll tell you, say that. He was a devout Muslim, but he was very tolerant uh, toward his non-Islamic subjects. And uh, many of the, the Arabic writers say that travelers found complete and general safety in his land, no injustice, no mercy given to anyone guilty of injustice. The thing that he's most famous for is his famous Hajj or pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, he left with 60,000 people, 80 camels, each loaded with 300 uh, pounds of gold dust. When he was in Egypt, he gave out so much gold to poor people that the economy of Egypt slumped and didn't recover for 12 years. Uh, he captured the city of Gao on his way back to Mali. And he also captured the two sons of Songhai King Asabai, whose name, that, the son's names was Ali Kalon and Suleiman Nan. He rebuilt the University of Sankori in Timbuktu, a city famous for its mosque palaces, trade, and diversity. Uh, Songhai was the largest and greatest of these Western Sudanic empires, which lasted from 1450 to 1750. Uh, the, the, the predominant people were the Songhai people. And Although it traded in gold, salt, and leather, the biggest industry was books. Uh, it was as large as uh, 540,500 square miles, which is two thirds of West Africa, and was larger than continental Europe. 
which is always interesting to me because I was taught that Europe was a continent, but it didn't conform to the definition of a continent. Uh, so that very frequently my teachers have called what uh, folks describe as Europe as being Western Asia. Songhai ruled portions of today's Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, and Nigeria. And they had a naval fleet. And the houses there were typically uh, two-story houses with an uh, upstairs toilet. Um, the foundation was laid by Sunny Ali Burr. Now, Sunny Ali Burr was Ali Kalon, who was the prince that was taken by Musa when he conquered Sangai. But he and his brother uh, escaped shortly after Mansa Musa uh, transitioned. And Sunni Ali expanded the empire, improved the organization of government and administration, even compared to Mali. Again, Sunni Ali was officially Muslim, but he also practiced the traditional African religions. And during that time, the towns and cities uh, were Muslim but the people in the countryside practiced traditional religions. And Sunni Ali's son did too. Um, he recaptured Timbuktu from uh, Mali. He captured Jenny. Uh, and because of his uh, adherence to traditional African uh, religions, his Muslim subjects revolted and they elevated Askia Muhammad to Ray to the throne. Um, Askia Muhammad built an effective army out of uh, prisoners of war and enslaved people and put them in service to the empire. He built the largest empire in the history of West and Central Africa, which was as big as the Indian subcontinent. He built universities in Gao, Jenny and Timbuktu. He created a highly centralized government made up of chiefs who headed various departments. He was deposed by his son who actually turned out to be a weak leader. I think it's very interesting that this is during the height of the so-called slave trade, understanding that the Arabs were uh, uh, were indulging in uh, chattel slavery. Now, many people often say uh, or ask the question or make the accusation that Africans uh, enslaved other Africans. And that is indeed true. Although if one were to do an uh, in-depth study of the types of enslavement, uh, the uh, the the African form of enslavement was not uh, dehumanizing, and it was basically a, a form of uh, prisoners of war. At some point, maybe I can do a lecture on that uh, co comparisons of the different types of slavery. Um, uh, Another kingdom was Kanem-Bornu, which uh, started out as separate kingdoms, but they merged to form an empire. And the people making up the empire were the Zagawa and the Kanuri. Uh, the, the early rulers were called Mais, and it existed in areas that are now part of Nigeria, Niger, Cameroon, Libya, and Chad. It was a contemporary of ancient Ghana and its strength and wealth lay in trading lasted from the 8th century until around 1900, although uh, supposedly writ written, written records began in the 9th century. Um, also a fallacy because so often Africans are described as an oral people who didn't write. But as my previous two lectures demonstrated, Africans invented writing. And there are scripts that are being found in uh, West and Central Africa, especially, and, and South Central Africa that uh, are very, very old. Uh, there were two dynasties in Kanem-Borna, uh, Bornu, the Dugawa dynasty and the Sefuwa dynasty. 
the first king practiced traditional religion and uh, so did his successors until the Safuwa monarch uh, embraced Islam. Uh, the final period began in 1571 with the reign of uh, May Idris Aluma. He was a contemporary of, of England's Queen Elizabeth. The house estates are located in what is now northern Nigeria. There were seven basic uh, states of which Kano, and that's misspelled, uh, Kano was the, uh, the dominant one. They were never centralized, they never formed an empire, but they were a loose confederation of independent states that sometimes cooperated with each other for common uh, objectives. Uh, as mentioned, Katsina was the lead state, but was replaced by Kano, which by the 16th century became a seat of government, trade, Muslim scholarship among the most important in West Africa. The Kano Chronicles, or a collection of uh, Hausa traditions. And they stated that the Fulani migrated into Hausa land and brought additional knowledge. Um, let's talk about some significant cities in these places. So often we hear about Timbuktu um, and uh, it's, it's, it's often used as a, uh, kind of a negative or uh, uh, very, very unimportant thing. But Timbuktu was settled in the 12th century and was an important part of both Mali and Songhai. It had a 14th century population of 115,000. At the same time, London had a population of 20,000. Timbuktu flourished due to trade in uh, salt, gold, ivory, books, and human beings. Had 26 textile factories where each master tailor employed 50 to 100 apprentices. It was the home of the Sankori University as well as other universities and it had a flourishing book trade. I can't overemphasize how important books were at that time. The university was built around 1300 and had 25,000 students from all over the world at the height of the Songhai Empire. And the students paid uh, their lecturers uh, in money, clothing, cows, poultry, and sheep. Many books from that university survive today, some uh, dating back to the 600s. National Geographic estimates that 700,000 manuscripts survived in Timbuktu, not to mention more than a million manuscripts that exist in private collections and in other uh, West African countries. It's noteworthy to mention that there were public libraries in this city. One of the prominent scholars in Timbuktu was a man by the name of Ahmed Baba. We don't hear very much about him, but uh, he was uh, a brilliant, brilliant scholar who should be known. Uh, he, he was born to a family of scholars and judges and actually was the last head of the University of Shankori. He wrote more than 40 books on various topics, including law, Arabic grammar, and philosophy. And it said that he owned a library of 1,600 books. When Sankori was uh, taken by the Moors and Moroccans in 1596, a lot of the scholars were executed, but he was taken to Marrakesh where he remained in prison, but they ultimately uh, allowed him to teach. And he taught uh, quite a few students. And actually many of his students are the ones who have written the history of uh, West Africa. Um, there is an institute in Timbuktu now called the Ahmed Baba Institute, which was established in 1970, has almost 30,000 books that are being studied, cataloged, and preserved. Um, a contemporary description of Timbuktu uh, written during the time of, of its height. And I wanna read this quote, Timbuktu has no equal among the cities of 
the Blacks and was known for its solid institutions, political liberties, purity of morals, security of its people and their goods, compassion towards the poor and strangers, as well as courtesy and generosity towards students and scholars. Uh, that is uh, uh, very positive. <clears throat> Another city in West Africa was Jenny, which is sometimes spelled with a DJ instead of a J. Interestingly, in many African languages, uh, I forget what you call it, but that DJ, uh, MW, and other combinations are, are very common. The area around Jenny was first settled around 200 BCE, but the city itself was founded in the 700s and was a walled city of two gates by the 16th century. It was also a prosperous trading center in gold and salt and was a leading center in the Mali Empire. It was also the home of advanced culture and a noted university. Uh, I do a lecture on the African origin of medical science. And one of the things that I found is that the medical school at Jenny has surgeons who successfully removed cataracts from the human eye in the 13th century. Successfully and regularly removed cataracts from the human eye in the uh, 13th century. And these folks were kidnapped and enslaved. Uh, that university was uh, said to have thousands of teachers and was a gathering place. The last city I want to highlight is Gao. It's the earliest mention uh, that we found uh, is in the 9th century, and the ruler converted to Islam in the 11th century. It too was a major part of Mali and Songhai and was described by uh, Muslim travelers as being one of the finest, biggest, and most fertile cities of the Sudan. Yep. The uh, famous Leo Africanus described it, the town is very civilized compared to Timbuktu. In the 1500s, there were more than 7,500 houses, not counting straw huts, and had a population of about 45,000 had buildings with glass windows, and the tomb of Askia Muhammad, which who we mentioned earlier is in Gao, and is currently a UNESCO World Heritage uh, Site. Final considerations. Now, these are only a few of the West African empires. There were more, not only in West Africa, but also in East Africa, Central Africa, and Southern Africa. Um, but I concentrated on West Africa because that's where most of uh, the ancestors of yeah. the enslaved Africans in America were taken from. Yeah, so leave with the yeah, questions. Were the kidnapped Africans really fortunate to be enslaved and why did the Africans enslave each other? Uh, this is a list of my references. Uh, you'll note that Many of my references are written by African people. Um, Ajayi, uh, Boahan, and I actually had an opportunity to meet uh, Professor Adu Boahan in the uh, in 1993 when I first my first trip to uh, Ghana, and uh, he was a very gracious host, and I was uh, struck. The thing about Ghana today is that the formality in visiting uh, was was consistent throughout the country. And one of the things that I noticed is that once we went through all those formalities, um, he had two walls of the room we were in um, filled with books, floor to ceiling. Um, Dr. John Henry Clark, who is uh, mm -hmm. just, uh, he was a, a brilliant, brilliant scholar who went blind from glaucoma toward the latter part of his life. And so his students would hire uh, young people to read for him. But he had so memorized, he had such a, a brilliant mind that he would say, I want you to bring me such and such book. It's, uh, it's on the, the, the second tier, the third row, and it's the fourth book. And I want you to turn to page 450 and read that to me. 
Uh, this is Dr. John Henry Clark. Basil Davidson is a white scholar who has written a quite a bit on Africa, some of which is quite good. Dr. Shekanta Joke, who we talked about in uh, in my last two lectures. Uh, also, one I mentioned that Dr. Joke had to write three different dissertations at the Sorbonne for his uh, doctorate degree. And one of them was pre-colonial Black Africa, where he did a comparative study of the political and social systems of Europe and Black Africa from antiquity to the formation of modern states. It's a brilliant book. Howard French is a more contemporary. He's actually uh, a journalist who has traveled widely. And uh, he uh, wrote a book that I recommend very highly called Born in Blackness. And he did uh, an extensive study of the Portuguese documentation of, of uh, their early tra travels in Africa. Michael Gomez is actually an Islamic scholar at one of the universities in, in who reads Arabic so that he has tr uh, translated many of the Arabic um, uh, references. John G. Jackson. A South Carolinian who uh, was an autodidact who wrote a book called Introduction to African Civilizations. Uh, he had a chapter on uh, these uh, things that I mentioned. Um, Malana Karinga did a, a, a very good job in um, outlining uh, an overview. Uh, I think uh, Brett has often mentioned the uh, general history of Africa. In volume one, uh, J.D. Page uh, wrote a chapter on the development of African historiography. I mentioned Ivan Van Sertema. Robin Walker is a British scholar who has written uh, extensively. And he wrote a book called When We Ruled, which is very difficult to find now. Uh, fortunately, I have it, and it is an encyclopedic um, uh, account of Africa, especially West Africa, uh, more than 800 pages. And Chancellor Williams, also another South Carolinian who taught at Howard University, uh, he was from Bennettsville, wrote a, a book that's time-tested and waterproof, as we used to say called The Destruction of Black Civilizations, Great Issues of a Race from 4500 BC to 2000 AD. And uh, Dr. Wi uh, Dr. Williams did his research by traveling. He didn't uh, necessarily read what other folk had written. He traveled throughout Africa and talked to the elder scholars and talked to the elders in the community and put his book together that way. So I'm going to stop here and let's open up to um, uh, any potential questions or anything. Do I think I have any more people just to speak up? We sure. We have few enough that we can just open the microphone and let people ask questions. Well, sure. I'll go ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and, and break the ice here with mine. One of the early uh, empires you spoke of had 200,000 troops. And that, what, what was the geography of that? And, and what did they do with those 200,000 troops? Well, actually, Ghana actually, um, under Tunka Minin, ancient Ghana did have uh, 200,000 soldiers, of which 40,000 were the artillery. And uh, they actually served. Uh, to try to expand the empire and to protect the empire because human nature being what it is, you know, I think it's very important that, that we, we uh, say that human nature is human nature. And- um, You mean acquisition on greedy? Greed, <laughs> well, uh, as a matter of fact- um, It's not new. Not new, not new. And, and, and there is no, um, monopoly on that. Uh, it's a, just a matter of degree. 
Um, so that was that was what what those two hundred thousand uh, soldiers were. And I mentioned that um, in in Mali, one of the rulers actually took his soldiers and turned some of them into farmers, uh, so that they could ensure that they always had a good food supply. Okay, you're muted. Not at all. A yes, quick sir. Question. What do you know, if anything, about any diplomatic relationships, if any existed ex uh, aside from trade relationships between these kingdoms and these nation states and the ones that we're more familiar with in Western Europe? Across yeah, ac actually, further. okay, that's a good question. Actually, um, the 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 reference from the journalist uh born in blackness goes into that fairly extensively um and talks about the the diplomatic relationships especially between portugal and parts of west africa and um at first it was very respectful it was mutually respectful uh but ultimately it um it broke down as uh, greed came, and as um, the and, and the greed for gold, because as as you might remember, uh, Ghana, the current day Ghana, was initially called the Gold Coast, and uh, it was because they were trying to uh, the the Europeans were trying to get as much gold. And one of the things that he says in Born in Blackness is that Mansa Musa's opulent display of his wealth was the thing that tipped off the Europeans to the presence and, 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 and pervasiveness of gold and made them uh, descend uh, like a pack of dogs on a bone to own, on Africa in order to try to do that. Um, as a student of the English language and, uh, and a former English major, I'm fascinated with what you've uh, described as the, um, the proliferation of books and publishing in that yes. part of Africa. And I, I can only assume, I don't remember now what year the, uh, the library at Alexandria burned, but I would assume that the library at Alexandria had been a repository for copies of these printed materials. And do you know if printed materials from West Africa had been sort of trafficked with uh, the monasteries, if not libraries, in Western Europe by that time? Well, Western Europe, is, as, as you remember, as you know, um, at that time, the literacy rate in Western Europe was very, very low. Right. And you mentioned monasteries, and it was mostly the upper caste priests that, that did most of the writing. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that because one of the things that, uh, that I didn't say, and I can't document this, uh, I've, been, I've, been, I've heard people uh, give opinions of this, but uh, you hear about the golden age of is Islamic scholarship. It never started until after 600. Mm -hmm. Before 600, you don't hear of anything. So you mentioned the Library of Alexandria. Uh, the inference is that just like the Greeks imitated the ancient Egyptians, so did the Arabs, and they benefited from this knowledge. Um, uh, you know, like algebra, mm -hmm. you know, as you know, uh, came from, from uh, an Arabic description of what they learned mathematically and what we now know from the two um, mathematical uh, papyri that's still in existence, the, especially the Ryan papyrus. So um, uh, to answer that question, I suspect that that is indeed the case. In fact, Dr. Goldman, when you mentioned the Baba, I forget now his first name. Ahmed in, Baba. Ahmed Baba, what first yeah. and instantly came to my mind is, um, as a linguistic matter, Baba sounds a lot like Papa and Abba. Mm -hmm. So from the Jewish tradition, you get Abba. And from the, um, the Latin comes Papa. I wonder if Baba 
in the case of Ahmed Baba or Ali Baba or any of the other Babas refers to a, a rabbi or a honorary father, the way that we would call a, a Spaniard or a Portugal Portuguese, Don Pedro or Don Corleone, whatever, Don this and that. No, no, that was his family name. Baba is a family name. That was his family name. Yeah. Well, Baba, um, Baba I think is also I think father is Hindu. Well, I think we I think we 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 kind of get off when we try to compare the African to the European or to that. And it was a it was a completely different system. So there's not a shared root, a shared linguistic root. No, not at all. Not gotcha. at all. Thank you, sir. Um, now, later on, as a matter of fact, uh, those folk who uh, are familiar with um, Kiswahili understand that Baba means father. So um, my brother, Derek Jackson, who's on now, is a priest and we call his title is Baba. We call him Baba Derek. So um, but again, it has, uh, it's a completely different uh, root. Yeah. You're saying that Baba has Swahili roots. Baba is a word in the Swahili language that means yeah. uh, father. The Tamil, the, the language of the Hindu area, there's a lot of Babas there that refer to and use the term as father, like a teacher. You know, I'm, let me see if I can remember the, that uh, Ivan Van Sertima did a uh, uh, edited a book called African Presence in Early Asia, and he has uh, scholars in that area who did uh, studies of of uh, populations in ancient China, ancient India. And one of the things that we found is that in ancient India, in the area now that's this, this really more Pakistan, there were um, black folk that uh, created the, the um, civilizations that, that we have there now. Uh, Maharinya Daro and Harappa were the names of the, the, the civilizations and um they were as i was taught they were invaded by aryans from the north who um came up with the uh the what we now call the caste system um but that um the hindu religion initially was uh was not as I understand it, uh, and I haven't read that for a while, but it was not uh, very strictly adherent to what we now know as the caste system. I thought Joseph Tolliver was going to ask a question there. Joseph, you look like you had something you needed to ask. Joe, you 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 can't you mute it. Yeah, my question was when you mentioned the um the, the Mali Empire that Musa was in charge, then his son took over, and his uncle. What was the reason for the decline so fast? Uh, his son was a very weak, weak ruler, and um, was not able to um, continue with respect. Um, you know, I, I guess we can we can see the decline in America based on weak leadership, mm -hmm. and the same thing happened except that um, they kept getting pressure from outside from uh, from um, Songhai, and uh, so eventually Songhai. But you know, it's it's interesting to me because you look at the length of time that these empires existed. And they all l l lasted longer than America. Okay. They all lasted longer than America. So, you know, we're not talking about something that happened precipitously. Okay. It was a, it was a process. Okay. That's what I was, thank you. Okay. 
Dr. Goldman, do, because we're dealing with millennia here, I mean, I think Alexander was BC, and so you know, 1066, you know, 1065, you mentioned, a thousand years later, and we get up to or the, uh, eight, you know, the 1600s when we have the transatlantic slave trade. How much of that ancient African history is still retained on the on the Gold Coast? Much of it is, you know. Um, I mentioned I, I did use the word jelly. I think the French call them griots, but the African word is jelly. And these are, it's hard to describe them. They're, they're actually, they're historians. They are uh, musicians. And from generation to generation, they memorize the history of a people, of a family, of a city. And uh, they pass it on from generation to generation. And it's, um, and it's, it's memorized. Much like uh, you, you go to a lot of Muslim scholars now, they can recite the uh, Quran cover to cover. Uh, uh, you know, um, there might even be some folk that can recite the Bible cover to cover. I don't, I, I have met them yet, but. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> well, the, the, the Ethiopia is, is, I'm told over and over again, the oldest empire there, and, and that brings me back to Bob Marley, who sounds like one of your jellies. But what what role did Ethiopia play in this? I hadn't heard them mentioned. Were they a 2,000 year old empire? Or Ali Selassie? Yeah, yeah Ethiopia. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I toyed around with the idea of trying to include East Africa and North Africa in the lecture. And I figured it would be too much. And I just narrowed it down to West Africa. But what what we now call Ethiopia actually was uh, certainly contemporary with ancient Egypt, and you had the uh, um, uh, you had Kush, and you had Nubia, uh, which were all basically in that particular in that area, and um, and I, I'd be more than happy to to to. Put together a lecture on those areas because they are very they were very very important um, um so uh but but you're right um ethiopia and actually interestingly enough um ethiopia in ancient greek i'm told meant burnt faced people so they actually referred to all of africa as ethiopia the ancient Greeks did, I'm sorry. Did that answer your question? So it, it raises more questions, so go ahead. Raises so to that last point, Dr. Gallman, in the New Testament, when Saul or Paul refers to the Ethiop, he may not have been referring to a person from what we think of as Ethiopia. He may have been referring to a person who was from the so somewhere on the continent. Yes. Thank you for yeah. that. If there was such a person as Paul or Saul. <laughs> oh, no, I don't doubt that at all. <laughs> Somebody had to write all that stuff. Uh, well, you know, I, I often, uh, and I might be opening up a, a can of worms here, but Derek and I often have uh, the discussion and um, I think that most preachers today are not Christians. They are Paulians. <laughs> Thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. You're singing my song. If you read the, the Norton Anthology of the Writings of Paul, I'm sorry for this tangent, y'all, you will see in it published a, an essay by Nietzsche who calls Paul Satan's apostle. <laughs> Satan's apostle. And makes the case wow. that what we consider modern day Christianity is Paulinity, not Christianity, uh, at least according to the Gospels. Yeah, most preachers uh, will quote Paul <laughs> and forget but, the um, not the, not not the first five. I often tell the preacher if it's not written in red in the first five books of the New Testament, I don't want to hear. It. <laughs> this sounds like another class. 
Dr. Goldman, you're we talking about Western Africa today. Sudan, on my map, is now in Eastern Africa. So the, the term Sudan, put that in context for me, because it appears to like run through all the way from the Red Sea all the way to the Atlantic. Yeah, it does. As a matter of fact, the Sudan geographical area, not the country, the Sudan geographical area runs in a band uh, just south of the Sahara, all the way across the big part of Africa from west to east or east to west, however you want to describe it. Is it desert? Or was it, I guess, 2,000 years ago, I didn't have trees even. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The, the, the climate, was it, when you said below the Sahara, was the, was the Sudan desert desertification at that, that time? Uh, no. Uh, the desertification of uh, the Sahara, <clears throat> excuse me, occurred over thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's actually ongoing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although, I forget what country that is. <laughs> One of the countries on the border of the uh, on the on the southern border of the uh, has actually created efforts to stop the desert desertification and yeah. they are reclaiming the lush lands and I think it's certain plants that they're yeah. they're uh, they're they're putting there that are attracting water. And so they were kind of, in a way, they are reversing the desertification. I'm, I'm sorry I don't know more about that, but I remember reading that some time ago. Dr. Gallman, I've got a, a question that doesn't necessarily have to do with the history here, but... Um, your own education and experience. Have you been to any of these places? And could you tell us a little bit about that? I have not been to any of the places that I described. I've been to Africa uh, several times. And um, my travels in Africa have mostly been um, <clears throat> Ghana, Nigeria, and Egypt. Um, Fortunately, I have had the privilege of being taught by people like uh, Asa Hilliard, who had been to Africa literally hundreds of times, Dr. Clark, who'd been hundreds of times, um, Anthony Browder, who's been hundreds of times, and uh, others who, who actually... Uh, have been able to pass on a lot of their their knowledge. Um, so uh, the answer, the, the the simple answer is, I've not been to ancient the area of ancient Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, other than northern Nigeria. But I didn't get a chance to um, to 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 travel very widely there. But um, I have been fortunate enough to be taught by people who actually uh, lived in Africa uh, and did uh, travel these areas. You have spent time in Egypt. Big pardon? You have spent time in Egypt, right? Yes, yes. <clears throat> and I was fortunate enough in Egypt to be taught, to be led by uh, a scholar, uh, Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Jacob Carruthers, who actually was, uh, he was out of Chicago and he created an organization called the Comedic Institute in which he studied under Diop and they actually learned um, how to uh, decipher and to read hieroglyphic language. So they were able to notice that uh, a lot of the translations that were actually being standardized were 
profoundly erroneous. <laughs> so, I, I know this is slightly off uh, the uh, time frame that we're dealing with, but Marcus Garvey wanted his, his big thing was taking people back to Africa. But was was it Liberia that he was? What was the his plan, and what kind of any type no. of <clears throat> authentic relationship that Garvey had mm. with understanding ancient Africa? Liberia actually was um, was uh, the brainchild of uh, James and Monroe and some slaveholders um, back in the uh, early 1800s. 1840, yeah. Um, Whereas Marcus Garvey was actually Marcus Garvey led the largest uh, movement of African American people and people from all over the world that the world has ever known. <clears throat> and basically, uh, he was not the typical back to Africa person. Uh, he his was. Africa <clears throat> should be for Africans, but if you are abroad, I think one of his sayings was Africa for Africans at home or abroad. If you were in the diaspora, then you were just as much African and you uh, were, were obligated to support Africa. So even though he did do some ships, and, and, and interestingly enough, you know, Marcus Garvey is the one who designed the red, black, and green flag that you see, uh, we call the liberation flag. Mm -hmm. And if you look, I think uh, there are flags that are used in some of the nations in Africa now that are based on his, on his okay. design, uh, both color scheme. I think uh, South Africa added go, uh, uh, yellowish gold because of the gold that they found there. But I think Kenya uh, has a version of it and, and several other countries. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. But Marcus Garvey <clears throat> basically uh, led a movement to try to make Black folk in America understand that they were African because, um, you know, uh, Interestingly enough, uh, the very first Africans who were brought here against their will wanted nothing other than to go home. Mm -hmm. The next generation uh, were born here, they were a little more comfortable, but they were being taught directly by their parents who wanted to go home. By the fourth or fifth or sixth generation, they just wanted to are more comfortable than enslavement. They didn't necessarily want to go home. And uh, so as a result of that, <clears throat> Marcus Garvey was saying, don't forget who you are, because uh, you know, as per the necessity for this class, we know that not only black folk were taught uh, against uh, not to 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 not even um, acknowledge or accept that they were Africans, um, whites were taught that uh, many things that were very, very untrue about us. And, and uh, the, next, the next lecture that I give next month, I'm gonna talk about some of those things, um, uh, give kind of an, an, an overview. I think Egypt is the big one, you know, that the ancient Egyptians were white. Um, and, and ironically, a lot of the uh, current day Egyptians are mad. They call us African Afrocentric craziness, not realizing that the people who are now Arab, who now dominate uh, Egypt, didn't get there until six, the six forties. You know, um, uh, as I mentioned, after the twenty fifth dynasty, there was a series of invasions by. The Assyrians, the Persians, and the Arabs, the British, then the Arabs again, and uh, and the Greeks. I, I forget the Greeks and the Romans. <clears throat> so that last, 
I guess, 400 years, four to 500 years of BC Egypt uh, uh, was, was basically a change. But then Arabs are a BCP, a Arabs in Africa are, B, uh, as Dr. Clark used to say, they're not a BC people, they're an AD people. And they didn't invade uh, Egypt until six, I think it was 642 AD. And that's when they uh, <clears throat> swept down into, um, into uh, Northern Africa, which is why Islam uh, was so strong there. But it, it's ironic <clears throat> that when um, the Romans conquered Egypt, I think Augustus Caesar wanted to go down into uh, Nubia into Kush, and uh, there were, uh, you know, Kush had a tradition of having uh, woman rulers. They call them Kandaki uh, rulers. We spell it Candace, C-A-N-D-A-C-E, but it's pronounced Kandaki rulers. And one of the Kandaki rulers, I'm, I'm in Narius, I forget how, her name, uh, it's an A name, a uh, Minorama or something like that. <clears throat> Met him and uh, looked him in the eye, and he backed down. Augustus Caesar backed down and went back. He said, "I don't want no parts of this." Um, and uh, so uh, there is a tradition. There, you know, one of the things that I was in a meeting earlier today, and uh, someone mentioned that. Uh, they were very disappointed growing up that we weren't taught that Africans fought back against enslavement. And uh, that's one, another one of the lectures I'd like to give, depending on um, what uh, Dr. Um, Adams does, because uh, we always fought back. You know, um, you just don't hear about it, but Africans did fight back. And uh, even during the, the red summer of 1919 in America, um, folks forget that 1919 was after World War I, so that you had a lot of black <clears throat> soldiers who had been overseas where they were treated like human beings, came back here and they wouldn't go take it no more. <laughs> So when uh, they were attacked to put them in that place, they fought back. And uh, so, and it's really interesting because most of the accounts that I've studied, they don't talk about the number of whites who were killed or injured. They just talk about the number of blacks that were killed. You mentioned earlier, I just, just the sidebar, when you mentioned uh, Marcus Garvey, and I read that Marcus Garvey and Ho Chi Minh worked as longshoremen together in New York. And I wonder oftentimes what they talked about. <laughs> That's interesting. OK, I didn't know that. Yes. Um, I know that Ho Chi Minh was here. Mm -hmm. And Ho Chi Minh had, had a tremendous affinity for Black Americans. I didn't realize he worked with Marcus Garvey. Yes. I'm, I would have learned to be a fly on that wall. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Dr. Goblin, as, as you bring us more into the, the to the era of the transatlantic, there's still things that we can go back into. Is that this everybody here needs to know that the that the addition of Dr. Goblin's lectures is a subset of the South Carolina people's history that can be something that can continue on in a different time frame. I mean, we can have these classes whenever we want to, but I'm fascinated with. Uh, with uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois in his golden years, he was 90 something, I think, when he moved to, it was to Ghana. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And but there's a picture that I have seen, a photograph that I have seen of um, Dr. Du Bois in Ghana with the flyer from the 1946 conference on the coffee table in front of him. Hmm. And I can't remember who had that picture, but I was just trying to dig it up again. And you know, I've been to his uh, his his house and his 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 burial place. He's uh, 
he had, they call it the the uh the W V Du Bois library, but it's it, it's his house in in Ghana, and he and his wife are buried there. And um, I was I have a picture of me in his study, and I just didn't know what to look for. I was just so happy to be there. <laughs> we'll take that out. <laughs> So but, Dr. Um, we're looking at your next installment being May 7th. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. And you'll send out something in advance so people will know what they could brush up on to ask questions? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. hadn't said something. I want to say something to Bob Derek. Are you really behind that, that icon there? <laughs> Probably there, maybe in a high meditative state. You don't want to. Uh, yes, I am behind that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to be nice and respectful today. <laughs> and sure not ask the, the questions I normally ask. <laughs> I'm sure Dr. Gallman appreciates that. Oh, no, I love the questions. We've been we we've been going at that for almost forty years. <laughs> <laughs> May you have another well, ben, Here's one for you, Doctor Garvin. Okay. What's the difference between African Islam and Arab Islam? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're more qualified to answer that than I am. Um. <laughs> But we know that um, everywhere Africans have been, they have Africanized institutions. Um, just like uh, we Africanized Christianity, uh, we Africanized educational processes uh, so that um, what little I understand about Islam I do know that Islam was Africanized by um, the, the practitioners. Now, there are some areas in which they have become almost fanatically uh, Islamic to the detriment of their Africanity um, to this day. And I, I can't explain it. Perhaps you can explain it, Baba Derek. I'll just give two simple answers. One is, in the African Islam, when you face East, you face the sun, not Mecca. Mm. Arab Islam, you face Mecca. Okay. And, and the second one is, women have roles in African Islam to be leaders. It's never happened in Arab Islam. So those two significant ways that is different. And that's okay. major. That is major. Did I say major? I think you said major. <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, facing east to Mecca is about the culture rather than the spirituality. Face east to the sun, you're talking about the spirituality of the cosmos. And so it's going to look different and be practiced different. That's my short answer. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Questions? Any other? Comments, concerns? Brett? Well, I'm, I have, I'm thinking down the road about things to ask when we get closer to the time of, of, uh, of our existence. Uh, my, my only experience in Africa had been in Libya when I was an American delegation that went to visit with Momar after the uh, Reagan bombed Tripoli and killed his daughter. And I went to see why 
Momo was the, the, the villain de jour. Uh, and it, it was real clear that Libya was the only country that nationalized their oil. And if that spread around, boy, there'd be a whole lot of, whole lot of pain and suffering in the banks. Mm -hmm. and Mr. Fox has joined us. And Carol Singletary is there, but uh, we're not going to call people out now. Dr. Gallman, this class may be ready to have dinner. I didn't hear you, D. I said this class may be ready to adjourn for dinner. I'm not sure if we've got more questions. Or... Okay. Okay. So the next gathering of the of the uh, um, Majeska School is tomorrow night uh, at six thirty uh, in Zoom land or in person at thirteen forty Elmwood, and uh, the topic I think gets into what I think is more kind of the nitty gritty stuff that we're looking at in terms of connecting the dots. So Dr. Green is going to take us through the um, the heavy hand of the. Uh, the, the, the planter class, the, the, the slavery folks that established uh, South Carolina as the, the only colony that was not started from the mother country with some kind of excuse for fleeing religious persecution. They were there to make money off of their enslaved people growing rice and, and uh, all kinds of other things. And so we will see, hopefully, everyone tomorrow night at 6.30.